profesor Matthew Carmona que está esta semana con nosotros de la Bartlett School de UCL de Londres que eh, bueno, ha un buen trabajo en, en diseño urbano tanto en investigación como, como en, en práctica relacionada al diseño urbano con un trabajo también importante en investigación sobre eh, el espacio urbano de las calles ¿ya? pero también de cuál es el ámbito de, 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 de la gobernanza eh, desde la perspectiva más teórica eh, que, que construye la disciplina del diseño humano. Thank you very much. Some of you look very cold. I'm nice and warm because I'm under this heat. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a piece of research I did a few years ago which led to a theory of urban design. Um, this theory is called the place shaping continuum. And what I'll do is uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about the model or the theory something about the nature of urban design and how we might understand urban design and some of the criticisms of urban design. And then I'll talk about the theory itself and the different parts of that theory and then draw it together with some conclusions. And it's a rather complicated set of arguments so I'll go reasonably slowly and if I see you yawning and falling asleep, then I'll, I'll finish quickly. <laughs> so let's see how it goes. I might skip through some bits as we go along. First of all, um, some thoughts about the nature of urban design and some recent debates on this subject. Now, if we look at the literature on public space, which I do in a book which I wrote a few years ago called Capital Spaces, then we can see that many of the debates about public spaces are very polemical. Lots of arguments made for and against contemporary, public, uh, contemporary approaches to public space. And Often arguments made on the basis of remarkably little evidence, really hard evidence about how public spaces is, are really used and appreciated by people. And the same goes for the larger field of urban design. In a more recent book, I look at quite a bit of the literature on urban design. And we see there a similar very partisan, very polemical set of arguments. And urban design is often criticised, and those who support the, the importance of urban design are often criticised. Some people argue that urban design is just a neoliberal tool. Um, it's a movement without adequate social content. Some people say it's too historic, it looks back to the past for its models too much. It's not forward-looking enough. Some people argue that it doesn't have values at the heart of discussions of urban design. There's a lot of arguments that urban design is too focused on the outcomes, design outcomes, rather than the intention design process. It's even been called the handmaiden of global capitalism by some. So some quite strong criticisms about urban design. And for me, who I sort of my background is as an urban designer, I find this quite curious because I see urban design 
as a discipline that aims to create more useful, less safe, more attractive, more sustainable, more economically successful places. That urban design is about creating better places for people to use. So some of these arguments, to the contrary, seem perhaps strange. So either there's something dramatic and wrong in what urban design and urban designers are trying to achieve, or there's a misunderstanding, there's a gulf in understanding between different parties, different individuals, people from different traditions, different intellectual traditions, who are coming to the subject of urban design. Now, urban design, when we look at it, when we start to get under the skin of urban design, it's what I've called a mongrel discipline. In other words, it's a mixed discipline. It draws its theories and its ideas from a very wide range of disciplinary and academic backgrounds. It's not a sort of pure science or a pure social science with its own set of unique theories. It borrows theories and ideas from all over the place and it puts them together in, a, in what we might call a body of thinking around urban design. Now some people say this is a good thing and they praise that. And they say it's good because urban design tries to integrate thinking. It's not based in a series of silos, silo mentalities, which some disciplines arguably are. It looks beyond to what a whole range of disciplines are doing. And they say that it's a relatively new discipline, it's intellectually incomplete, so intellectually it's still developing as a discipline, and that's a good thing. Others say it's not a good thing, and they say it's too vague as a set of ideas. It's too ambiguous. It suffers from an intellectual anarchy, and an absence of a dedicated intellectual core of its own. They say it's too mundane, too orthodox. And some people say that it's too obsessed with the eternal truths of its particular prescriptions for places, which are too unflexible, rather than thinking about what are the wider social and economic consequences of uh, development. Now, critics of the latter type often reject urban design as a freestanding field and instead they see it as a subset of something larger, something bigger. They say urban design should be part of urban studies or part of urban planning or part of larger debates around sustainability or it's just a subset of architecture rather than being something unique and, and, and significant on its own. Partly this, I think, is because of its relatively small size as a discipline. In the UK, for example, this represents the size of our different professional bodies. And we have quite a siloed set of professional organisations representing the built environment. By far the biggest is those who represent real estate, property profession. Then architecture, represented by the Royal Institute of British Architects, about 28,000 <coughs> architects in the UK. The planners are a bit smaller, landscape. And urban design is tiny compared with the others. It's a relatively small discipline. Perhaps because of its relatively small size, Stephen Marshall, a professor in the Bar, 
has argued that urban design is at least partly what he's called pseudo-scientific. In that he argues that many of its underpinning ideas are not properly tested. Um, they're not scientifically tested in the way that they would be in other sciences or other social sciences. They're often adopted, ideas are often adopted in a rather uncritical way and just brought into the canon of urban design. But for Stephen Marshall, that doesn't mean that we should abandon urban design as a sort of body of intellectual thinking of its own. It means that we need to fortify it. We need to work to develop that body of thinking more. We need to strengthen it. So for me, all this, a couple of years ago, raised the issue of what, if anything, is unique about urban design. What, if you like, might be its intellectual core. If we look at the theories and ideas that underpin this mongrel discipline, then urban design exists first as an amalgam of knowledge and practice which is drawn from these other fields that I mentioned, these other academic and professional fields. But second, it exists as a distinct, a distinct and evolving field in its own right, which gives new meaning to its borrowed knowledge. So that knowledge is often taken from elsewhere, but then it's rethought and, and, and uh, used in the context of urban design. So gradually over time, urban design has developed its own core, or at least a set of ideas that you might say begin to suggest a core of thinking for urban design. Many of these are based on ideas and writings which go right back to the evolution of urban design. The sort of foundational texts of the subject. Writers such as Gordon Cullen and Jane Jacob, who were writing 50 years ago, really established a set of ideas which we continue to use and continue to draw from. But to this core, new knowledge is continually, continually borrowed, developed, related to the original thinking, and gradually, gradually, the body of thinking uh, develops. However, despite this, there remains a tension at the heart of this discipline of urban design. And most obviously that occurs between academics and practitioners who come from different disciplinary backgrounds. In particular, those who come from a more social science tradition and those who come from a more design tradition to urban design. So the literature is full of criticisms of design-led approaches to development criticising such approaches as physically deterministic or simply irrelevant when placed alongside larger social economic trends and debates and considerations. At the same time, we can all point to the sort of long-term negative consequences of places where design has seemed to be forgotten because of the headlong rush to meet certain political or economic objectives. So to quote myself, um, I would say there's danger in both of these perspectives. Both perspectives are equally troubling. The first advances a spaceless, political economy perspective, 
challenging the very notion of urban design itself. And the second advances a placeless physical aesthetic vision for a phenomena that will always be rooted in both place and space. So you need both. Both of these traditions have important contributions to make to discussions and practices of urban design. In reality, physical form will impact decisively on any socio-economic potential of this space. Just as the socio-economic context will always inform any adopted design solution, both relate to and inform each other. Equally, neither by themselves will determine absolutely the outcomes. So design thinking can only go so far. Also, socio-economic, social science thinking as well. <clears throat> so where then is this core of urban design thinking? Well, the answer I've suggested is perhaps through a focus on the process of urban design. Urban design is ultimately about place, new, old, physical and social place and about the creation and recreation of place. But it's also about the processes for good or bad, intentionally or unintentionally, that shape places for users. So it's both about place and it's about process. A key problem, however, lies in the fact that few urban design interventions are really subject to analysis that compares the process by which they were created with the outcomes that result. So rarely do we see urban design projects subject to post-occupancy evaluation in the way that buildings often. And therefore there's not a a lot of writing and understanding about the process of urban design and how that varies from place to place and how that ultimately influences outcomes. And this plays into another criticism of urban design, that it's obsessed with the finished product and marginalises, which marginalises its understanding of the long-term processes of place, place creation. And I think nowhere is this more apparent than in the US, where there seems to be an obsession with the latest urbanism, whatever that is. Ecological urbanism, ethnic urbanism, everyday urbanism, landscape urbanism, new urbanism, post-urbanism, there's a whole series of these urbanisms. And these tend to seek to sort of neatly package particular favoured types of physical form, often with a little bit of prescribed social or ecological content, but often end up in cyclical debates about aesthetics and little more. In the UK, we're no better. We often spend a lot of time discussing particular projects and their impact on the city. But we don't really ever, or very rarely, analyse how they were created and the processes that led to their creation and how those impacted on whether ultimately the project is successful or not for our city. But arguably, it's exactly these process factors that determine how places are shaped and which, if we study them, will provide a core to our understanding of urban design, to our theory and our practice of urban design. 
And importantly, these sort of processes relate not only to the self-conscious design process, where a designer has a particular project or problem to solve and goes through a design process to achieve an outcome, but it would also apply to the unconscious processes of urban change that go on around us all the time without any conscious design actually happening. The process is adaption and change. And I argue that both of these types of process, both self-conscious and unself-conscious, are part of urban design and they're part of this place-based continuum of change. Now, through the medium of public space and looking at public spaces in London, I developed a few years ago this theory of an urban design continuum. And you might think public spaces are not necessarily a good mechanism to understand these larger processes of change. But in fact, the study of public spaces gives you very good insights into larger urban development processes because public space projects are typically part of larger development projects or part of larger urban regeneration projects or relate to particular policy initiatives. So they often, studying public space projects gives you an insight into these larger processes of urban change. This particular project was called Capital Spaces. I flashed up the book that, that um, resulted from this, this, uh, this research project earlier. And as well as the sort of standard literature review, it, the project itself looked at new spaces, new public spaces that were created across London since 1980, well, between, between 1980 and 2012. And we did a whole series of very detailed analysis over a period of two and a half years, looking at spaces at that sort of global London-wide scale, but also locally, looking at a whole range of very detailed case studies, and understanding how they were used, but also how they came into being. What were the different stakeholders involved in particular public space projects? What was their role? What were their aspirations? And how did those different roles inform, ultimately, what was created? And almost by accident, after finishing this particular project and writing the book and publishing the book, rethinking some of the, um, some of the evidence that we had gathered, I started thinking about how it might inform a larger sort of model or theory of public space, oh, sorry, of, of urban design. And this is what came to be known as this place shaping continuum. And this has three key elements to it, this idea or this model has three key ideas. The first First is two key contextual factors. The history and traditions of a place, which vary in multiple ways depending on where we are in a particular place, and they vary from one generation to the next. And these combine with the contemporary polity or the politics um, the prevailing political economy of the time. So the historic context is informed by the current politics in place. So that's the first element. The second element is then for place shaping processes. Design, development, space in use and management processes. I'll come back to all of these and discuss them a little bit more depth in a second. And the third element in this model is the power relationships, the power between the different stakeholders involved in any particular project or particular place, which varies in inconsistent ways depending on 
depending on different projects. So those are the three elements which I'll now discuss in a little bit more depth, using London as my sort of case study drawing from the research that I mentioned on public spaces. So let's start then with that first element, the context for urban design, the place and the polity, the place and the politics. Urban design is situated in both place and time. And so sometimes we're obsessed with the here and now, but how we shape places is always informed by the past. The accumulated history of how things are done, how practices work, um, which change from place to place. Also by the fact that innovation in design, true innovation, is pretty rare. And we build on what others have done with small changes and small innovations over time. This means that urban design processes begin long before our contemporary proposals are ever dreamt up. If we're working on a particular project, we might focus exclusively on the here and now of that project. But actually, all the things that are informing that project are often were established, those ways of doing things were established a long time before. If we look at London, for example, as a case in point, then London has almost 2,000 years of history. And for at least the last 350 years of that history, we've pretty much done things in more or less the same way. That we have a series of very powerful developers and landowners who often take the lead in large development projects, guided by market opportunity and a light touch regulatory process. Also by a fragmented state. So lots of fragmented regulatory processes involved in London. And this is the way we've done things for at least 350 years since the Great Fire of London. You might say it's the London way of doing things. And every city has its own way of doing things that have often developed over a long period of time. Even different cities in the same country will often have quite different traditions. So you might say this is a bit like a hand stretching through history which dictates the way we do things today and which varies from one place to the other. In London, you might say this London way of doing things was neoliberal long before neoliberalism was invented. It's the very essence of that way of thinking. And that has profoundly influenced the way the city is seen and experienced today, the physical nature of the city, the social nature of the city. Yet even in the most stable societies, and I would say the UK and London is one of them, urban design continues to evolve and our approach to urban design continues to evolve. In the study of public space that I refer to, we looked at the period of 1980 to 2012. And within that period, we can see three sub periods, if you like, where things evolved and was, were done slightly differently from time to time. The period from 1980 to 1999, for example, we can see as a period of neglect but also innovation in the way public spaces were realized. Generally, it was a period where the state, the government, and local government, really neglected the city to a large degree. There was a, no, very little public investment during that time in the city. But at the same time, developers and the private sector continued to develop in the city and were quite innovative in the way that they approached public spaces in particular. 
developments such as Broadgate in the city of London or Canary Wharf have had a very lasting impact on the city in terms of the way public spaces are created and recreated today. Then we had a period from 1999 to 2008, which we could say was a period of urban renaissance, a reinvestment in the city by the public sector, a stronger interest in design. Um, we had a new mayor, well, the first mayor for London was elected in 2000, and that new governance framework had a big impact on the way things were done in the city. So things changed, but all the time, the basic London way of doing things remained pretty much intact. And more recently, we've seen a slight change, still a continuation of these urban renaissance policies, but uh, a slight diminution of them, uh, a slight retrenchment back to the sort of neglect of the past as we've hit economic crisis and there's not been so much money to go around to invest in the city. So we see these three periods within this larger historic continuum. And so both the history, the historic way of doing things, and this contemporary politics affects the way the city is shaped. Within each of these periods, and over time, we have a series of consistent place-shaping processes. And these represent this second dimension of this theory of urban design. And in fact, as I mentioned, there are really four of these. There's design, there's development, there's space in use, and there's management processes. So these begin with design, but all of these processes are equally important in the way that we experience places today. <coughs> so, so, Moving uh, on to design, which is the first of these. Design is obviously critical to the way that projects are created and the way our aspirations for places are developed and uh, mediated in the context of any particular place. <coughs> and most people see design as an analytical, a creative process, a cyclical process, a process of self-conscious design. And many projects, well, all urban design projects, are self-consciously designed in a knowing way, usually by specialist designers who have gone through a lot yourself who are highly skilled at conceiving projects and communicating those projects and at creating particular solutions for places. And design itself has a series of stages through which it goes through in the creation of design outcomes. And I won't go through these now because uh, I'm mindful of time. But I think you've been given the paper on which this uh, talk is based. And if you're interested, you can read more about these sub-processes within each of these larger stages of the continuum. The second set of processes is around development. And public space case studies in London demonstrated there's no consistent development process. 
almost every project has a different development process at its heart. For each project, the lineup of stakeholders or actors involved will change. The power relationship between them will change. Um, although each of them will use design as an important way of shaping those development aspirations in a self-conscious way. Dealing with financial and regulatory and contextual and market issues to deliver development outcomes. And again, just like design, there will be a series of stages that a development process will go through. And all of these are important in dictating the final outcome. And each of these will be complex in themselves. Then there's what I've called shaping through use or spacing use. And here we get to the unselfconscious processes of change. So whilst design is clearly self-conscious, a designer sits down with the intention of designing a solution to a problem. After a place is created, it doesn't just stop changing, it carries on changing and being shaped, but not necessarily by design any longer, but simply by the way those places are used and appropriated by people and used over time. So the continuous flux of the modern city dictates the way our, we appreciate and experience uh, the city and the outcomes from design and development processes. And again, there may be different types of sub processes associated with that, <coughs> related to the range of activities, the associations between different peoples and different types of users, different amenities that develop over time, the way places adapt and the way they are appropriated, all of which impact on the way we subsequently experience the place. And then the final set of processes is what we might call management processes. So if we create a space or we create a place and we leave it to its own devices, then those activities of use of people will ensure that it changes through time. But rarely do we ever leave a place entirely to its own devices. We manage places, sometimes actively, sometimes less actively. And these processes of management give rise to small-scale, often incremental changes to space and place but nevertheless significant. New street furniture, new signage, repair, repairs to the pavement, planting. Sometimes these are consciously designed and sometimes not. They just happen. Somebody's made a decision to change all the street furniture in, in a city. And so that happens without thinking about what is the consequence for a particular place. Or it may be to do with the way we police places. And that type of management, which affects the way that the place is subsequently used. So it's not just all about the physical elements, but it's about how we manage places socially as well. Who we include and who we might exclude through management processes, either consciously or self-consciously. Or, or unselfconsciously. So these management processes also have sub processes involved with them and sets of decisions which impact on the way places are shaped. So we've had these historic processes of change <laughs> and the contemporary politics. We've also had these four distinct types of process that lead to change. 
And the final element of the model is the power, the power relationships that dictate how places are shaped through time. And these power relationships between different stakeholders inform all everything that I've talked about so far. So who has the power when it comes to urban design intervention? Well, this idea of power is well documented in the literature on uh, urban design and urban development. Which typically says that those who have the greatest power are those who have the most resources. The landowners, the developers, the investors in a place are often seen as having the greatest power. But that's not the whole story. Because it varies from project to project, from place to place. In our analysis of our London public space case studies, there was no single set of power relationships. It varied tremendously from project to project. We did 13 detailed case studies, just three of which were led by and delivered by, by, the private, uh, by private developers acting alone. One by a state-operated private company, one by a private-public partnership, one by a private social enterprise partnership, five by the public sector, and two by charitable bodies. So, from project to project, those power relationships will vary depending on who the key actors are. In fact, in the case studies that we did, we found that public space is shaped and reshaped by six key factors, or six key types of uh, uh, actor and uh, power relationship. The first is the aspirations, resources and determination of those who own the space, whether public or private. Those who are creating or recreating the space. Second, by the aspirations, powers and skills of those with regulatory responsibilities who might be different to those who own the space. Sometimes are, sometimes not. And their willingness to intervene or not in these design, development, management processes. Third, by the aspirations, skills and sensibilities of the designers associated with any particular project and the scope that the first two sets of actors give to them to design. Because inevitably as designers, we're limited by the scope with which our clients or regulators uh, allow us to design a particular project. <coughs> and also by the awareness of these designers of the needs and aspirations of the next three groups in this list. And the next three groups start with the local communities and their ability and determination to influence the development process, which varies from community to community, from place to place. Fifth, the aspirations, resources and abilities of those with long-term management responsibility, which are sometimes the same as some of the other groups and sometimes quite different. But they have a big impact way places are shaped. And then finally, the manner in which everyday users, the general public, use a place um, and define that place and redefine it through their, their, their use. In London, the relationship between these groups varies from development to development. And urban design, we found, generally involves a larger range of stakeholders and interested parties than, say, an architecture project. They're often quite complex, involving lots of different organisations and individuals. Ultimately, we concluded that the structure, in other words, the elements that I've discussed so far, those different processes, the politics, the way things are done, 
is more important than the agency. The agency being those different power relationships. Because those power relationships vary so much from project to project. So both are important in the way places are shaped, but for us, structure seemed to trump agency. And that power waxes and wanes. So for example, a public space manager has very little power at the start of the development but a lot of power at the end, once that project has been realised. The designer has some power at the start, because they're engaged in the design process, but after it's been completed, they have no power. And that power falls to somebody else, in terms of the way that that building, that space, that master plan is subsequently shaped over time. So these power relationships change during the course of this long-term process. Ultimately, I would hypothesize that the story of public space can't be grasped without understanding this full range of influences that act on a particular place which shape the processes and shape the outcomes of development pro projects. So we need to understand and critique urban design in terms of both its normative outcomes, but also in order to theorise and influence it, we need to understand this process that I've been talking about. This process informed by these horror historical place-based modes of operation, set within the contemporary polity or politics of today and the policy that which that influences, defined by the particular power relationships between stakeholders in any one place, across these four related dimensions of design, development, space in use and management. Sometimes self-conscious, <coughs> sometimes unself-conscious, sometimes knowingly applied to places, and sometimes unknowingly applied to places. And across time and across history, these discrete episodes change places across time, and that process gradually changes also uh, across time. So, to draw some conclusions. In the paper that you've been given, I argue that this then is urban design. Urban design is not a physical intervention in pursuit of narrow project outcomes, nor a set of normative design objectives. It's not a particular style or trend-based urbanism, or or, or a constrained response to any particular borrowed intellectual construct. It's certainly not a rejection of the very notion of urban design, um, simply because design is evolutionary or, or a mongrel discipline, or simply a difficult discipline to understand. Instead, I argue that urban design represents an ongoing journey through which places are continuously shaped and reshaped, physically, socially, economically, through periodic planned intervention, through day-to-day -day occupation, and the long-term guardianship of the place. So in all its complexity and variety, the process by which urban places are shaped defines, for me, this unique core to urban design and greater focus on these processes, to me, won't devalue or dismiss the debates about <coughs> normative outcomes from design, or what is or what isn't good urbanism. It wouldn't devalue discussions about the relationship 
between different disciplines and different theoretical contributions to the subject. Instead, I think it would act a bit like an anchor core, as the sort of core of the discipline. Similar, you might say, to the way that ethnography is a subject which is anchored by its methods, or law is anchored by the system of government. And if we understand this core and we engage with it, then arguments over its periphery, what is the nature of the outcomes that we're seeking to create through urban design, matter less. And to my mind, this understanding, this process, this core, is an subject for intellectual discussion and debate and also for innovation in practice relating to design, to urban design. So you've got this, uh, I think, this, this article. If you want to find out more about um, the inputs into these ideas, then uh, there's more articles on them if you go to his website. Thank you. suggesting it is that urban design in a way is the larger subject which almost incorporates everything else related to the built environment because it's about these long-term processes of shaping place of which planning which is often associated with particular regulatory processes is part and parcel of that shaping process but is only one of those influences and all of the other built environment disciplines also feed into the way places are shaped. So, those of you who were at the talk last night would know that, in my view, planning and urban design are completely integral to each other. They're, they're, they're completely, they should be strongly associated with, other, with each other. And the aspirations of planning should relate strongly to the achievement of better quality urban design. But also I see urban design as this larger set of processes um, of which planning is sort of embedded in a way, rather than necessarily the other way around. But I'm not hung up on the relationship between different disciplines and bodies of, of thinking. I think we can come up with different models in that. Um, what is important is to understand that they all make a contribution to the way places are shaped. You've told us about a criticism that uh, I don't know who made about uh, urban design. 
about being not so scientific? How much of scientific is urban design? How much of art? Because there is a uh, regulatory uh, laws. Uh, you have this, uh, architecture who could be more artistic or not so. Uh, but which place does urban design take in this uh, major thinking scheme? Because uh, you, compare, you said that between the social sciences, urban design is maybe it's not so scientific as the other. I know for the urban design could be defined as a social science or not. That is my confusion. Well, I would say that urban design certainly draws heavily from the social sciences, or should. Um, the author you were referring to is Professor Stephen Marshall, who's a colleague of the Bund. And he has made an argument that urban design is what he calls pseudo-scientific. <coughs> what he's saying is not that, not that urban design doesn't have scientific legitimacy, but that urban designers, both academics like myself and practitioners, tend to adopt ideas without being, without critically testing them. So in a pure science, before you adopt an idea and you put it into practice, I don't know, in, in, in medicine for example, you thoroughly test it to make sure that that is a scientific idea which is not going to lead to some sort of um, medical disaster. Whereas in urban design, we tend to adopt ideas and without testing them, and then we create places which don't work because we've not properly understood in a scientific way some of the ideas which are underpinning our responses to place. My confusion could be because I think that architecture maybe is not really a scientific discipline, and not everything in architecture can be tested or complemented uh, or prefigured. So uh, I, th I think we're talking about two different things, obviously, but uh, we're architects, uh, we are architects, uh, we are studying architecture, so now that we're entering the urban design realm, we're going somewhere else, or this comes from architecture, or the, what are the relations between urban design and architecture, because maybe what you're saying is that they are completely different. No, I'm not saying that. No? <laughs> architecture, by its very nature, draws on the creative design process. And that's fundamental to the way we create architecture. And, and, and urban design is the same. Um, and, but through that creative design process, we explore and we create ideas and we challenge ideas and we create responses to place. And that design process can be equally as rigorous as a scientific process. Um, or it can be based on just your preferences and my preferences and somebody else's preferences. So, Stephen Marshall, and it's not me who's saying this, it's Stephen Marshall says that before adopting ideas from elsewhere, we need to be better at critically evaluating them and deciding whether they apply and whether they don't apply. And part of that testing will be through the design process, through this creative design process that architects are uniquely responsible for within the built environment. So I think they're completely interrelated, but ultimately, part and parcel of creating good places is through being creative and trying things out and experimenting. So I don't, I don't fully subscribe to all of what my colleague is suggesting, but I think it does introduce some interesting ideas about how a small discipline like urban design operates within the context of the much larger disciplines that surround it. I think that this very interesting for me uh, point of view is that 
you're trying, I, I ask you, if you are trying to, uh, with your thinking, you are, I, I don't know if you're trying, would you uh, configure a, a new piston, the epistemology of urban design? is uh, very necessary because we always are in this environment and tend to, to, to go in the flu, uh, not knowing if, uh, uh, which, is a, which is the place of uh, a designer, which is the, 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 the role in society and from where uh, uh, an architect can be. So uh, it's for me it's very interesting because you 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 um, dare to to do it. Uh, something that I haven't read very very few. That's the first comment. The second is that uh, in your point of view and your your conception of urban design help us to get out of uh, traditional or used uh, relationships between architecture planning and urbanism. As we are new, I think we as schools are new in urban design because this, this matter, I want to tell you like that, it comes from, uh, I think we, we have uh, developed this since 10 years ago. And it has been a long discussion inside that. The school is the, in the prof, the, prof, the teacher, because everybody tries to, to take a place or to, to look, to see which is a place in one another in the teaching students and what for we are teaching them, which, which uh, kind of knowledge, knowing the knowledge we can should deliver. And uh, the use, I uh, come back to this the used relationship uh, between planning and urban design and uh, architecture uh, is seen by you otherwise, completely otherwise, saying that urban design is, is uh, if an architect wants to be an urban designer, he is, uh, must be, can be an architect, but he must widen their, open their, their thinking, their thoughts to a very much larger uh, questions and uh, very much larger uh, I would say questions that are involved in the fact of being and making urban design. And what is for me also interesting is that you place place the core of the, of the question. The, it, is, it is about creating places, and places are not made by one or another uh, self-conscious or, or not self-conscious processes, but it is a question of uh, combining and uh, inter combining, completely understanding how things, uh, how Things are made by very uh, by a, uh, a complex system of of, uh, of um, uh, factors, uh, and uh, that uh, puts the urban design in, a, in another level of, uh, of thinking. Uh, it's uh, it is design in itself, but it is urban in itself, but it is also thinking about development, thinking about ideas, political ideas, it's thinking about uh, it's taking the, being conscious of different power relationships that evolve, that uh, are different in you know, the time, and, uh, uh, and, and for us it's, uh, we used to see, or see, feel inside school, I tell you that students, we used to feel in, in the school that urban design is quite as that as that 
image that you put inside it. But now you, you, can, uh, you can imagine, which is the, the challenge to be an urban designer. It is much more about uh, a, a wider comprehension of uh, processes than, than just uh, being a chain in between a great scale. This is another, another used concept yeah. argument that uh, places urban design in between planning, yeah. planning and architecture. Yeah. It's not that. It's, it's, we have to take, uh, get out completely about the, of this thinking. And I think you, uh, you are courageous <laughs> to try to, to <coughs> understand this uh, uh, in another way and try to communicate it. It's not easy to do. No, absolutely. Yeah. Urban design is far more complex far more interesting than architecture and planning, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. In, in, um, in the bar, we, we have similar tensions, or we have had in the past. We, we actually have, or we had, five years ago, we had five different programs of urban design. It's quite a big place. Each of which came from a different tradition. So we had one within the planning school that came from a more social science tradition. We had one in the architecture school that was sort of from a more design tradition. We had one in what we call our development planning unit, which was very much focused on urban design in the sort of global south and the issues related to, to urban design there. We had uh, a, a fourth one that was from an urban, urban studies tradition. And then we had a fifth one that was from space syntax. And they were all different urban design programs. And I got really frustrated a few years ago, and I created a sixth one, <laughs> which brings all of those five together and allows students for the first time to actually dip into each of these and take things from each of them. And to me, that's what urban design should be doing. It should be embracing these different bodies of thinking, different ways of thought, and bringing them together in ways that create new and interesting exciting thoughts in themselves, um, rather than getting stuck within one silo or another. That's also, that uh, remembers me in a uh, 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 thinking that I came out, uh, out yesterday mm. out of your conference, mm. was that uh, this, this uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is uh, British, I think it could be British. Mm. This uh, 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 thinking and being that is not constricted by regulations is a being that is uh, you have no constitution, you have no common law. Mm. You have so uh, the framework when the framework is is there. Putting, putting together all these uh, this, uh, factors inside, uh, inside architects or whoever can come and do self-consciousness, self-conscious or not self or not, uh, the, uh, the buildings, constructions, uh, projects. So it's a flexibility inside a, a larger thought. That you can, can uh, put everything in relationship, even if they are very different. Yeah. And that is also interesting because when we make, um, uh, when we are, uh, when we uh, get, we make very things, we, uh, we are afraid of being uh, designing, drawing. A great place, a great part of the city, of what we are not, uh, the, will control the, the history. Yeah. So, urban design projects become uh, a very a finished, yeah. a finished uh, uh, resource, uh, finished objects. Yeah. And uh, we, we realize that city makes it herself a lot of time. Yeah. And, we are not the authors. Yeah. I say authors. I've always said to students that architecture is of authors, 
and uh, the design piece of uh, actors. Mm -hmm. So, because it is it's, it's not a, it's a obra, it's not a, it's not a, it's not just a result of what you say. It, in architecture, you are free, relatively free. You have a client to to deal with him, to and make and have a greater uh, a greater uh, synergy. Yeah. But uh, this, uh, when you see the framework, when you start, when you, I, when, for me, I understood it, from my understanding, when you create or uh, framework, you think from public space. The, the point of the part is the public space. Is the city as herself. Inside the city is very diverse. And uh, that is also uh, very important for us because we are used, used to have a planning systems from so our normative society have has a plan and what fits in the plan is done mm -hmm. and uh, oh, it, 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 if it could be a little bit more than what fits in the plan. So the plan is what makes our, our uh, is what controls the form of what we are doing. But this planning is made in, in uh, private, uh, so it's for lots, it's, it is for uh, for uses, but so it is oh, uh, it regulates the private the private space, and the, the, so the, the public space is done by the nobody. Uh, so, I don't know what it is. Um, with the concept of a place shaping continuum. It's like an endless process of a place, and the place is linked to a location. And when you change the place too much, or the process goes on, um, when when does a place die and become another completely new place? Because if 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 a place is more than a location, when when does a place change and become another one? Good question. <laughs> I would say never. I'd say you always, you can always see traces of what came before. Um, if you look at a big enough scale. Um, reminds me of a, uh, a recent project of a colleague of mine who was given a part of uh, a city to look at and to create a sort of new master plan for him. And his starting point was to look back at historic maps. And he discovered through this historical research that this particular part of the city, nobody knew, but that was the very origins of the city. It was the original market of the city. And there's almost no trace of that now. But you can still see it in the historic maps. And then when you start to move out from that particular place, you can understand why that was, because of the, the connection, the network of roads and streets that feed into this place. And therefore you begin to see the opportunity that the place has in the future to once again become the centre of this particular town. So there's always traces of the past. But even if there isn't any physical traces of the past, there's ways of doing things, ways of developing which are unique to the place, which continue through time, which might change, as I've suggested, slowly, but basically are still there. You, know, you referred to the way that we do things in the UK, which is a very flexible, discretionary process of development. And that's unique to, well, not, not unique, but it's, it's, it's something which is very characteristic of all British cities. But even within each of those cities, the way that operates varies place to place. And even within a city like London, we have 33 boroughs, and they all have slightly different ways of doing it. So there's these layers upon layers of complexity, but ultimately the places that we're dealing with continue through time to be shaped and reshaped, and sometimes that means almost starting again and 
and seeing almost no physical trace, but it's still the same place. It still has those same relationships to the wider context, which it always has, whether that's the natural context or the human context created in the city around them. So there's always something which continues forward, I think. You seem to strongly believe in the effectiveness of urban planning and um, I wanted to ask you what is your perspective of the role or the effectiveness of urban planning in Latin American cities, at least from your, what you've seen of this city so far? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, I have to say that I've only been here two days. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so I think you have to take anything that I say with a pinch of salt, as we say. Um, but I, I would say there's need in this city for a stronger hand in setting out aspirations for the city and in setting out a future vision for the different parts, the different communities within the city. I think there's probably much too much reliance on the private sector and letting the private sector do what they wish without thinking about what is the larger implications for the communities affected and the city as a whole. And I think that's in, we have, you have that in common with London, my home city, to some extent, in that in London we have a very deregulated process. And sometimes large, powerful developers come along and create things which are going to be there for the next 50 years and which everybody agrees were big mistakes. <laughs> and probably there should have been a lot more thought gone into those development projects beforehand. Um, but as I say, I'm new to the city, so you have to, you have to forgive me if my impressions are wrong. <laughs> Do you think, um, I don't know, a it's, it's a discussion actually, like um, if um, a greater authority on urban planning uh, would solve those problems of this city, like if there would be a, a global perspective on the city, do you think it would be a solution? I think planning, strategic planning, local planning done right can be a very powerful and positive force of change. Um, in London again, before 2000, we didn't have a London plan. We didn't have a mayor of the city. So there was no strategic planning framework. Since 2004, we had our first London plan. And that has made a huge difference to the way the city is planned. And I understand you don't have a, a mayor for the whole city here, and you don't have a strategic plan. And that's, that's a disastrous way for me. <laughs> I think a powerful city like this, you need to have a powerful voice in a politician who represents the city. And one of the key tools of that politician needs to be strategic planning. And I think that re really will benefit this city as it has done London and many other cities. Of course, strategic planning can also be a force for ill if it's not done well. And we have seen examples of that in the past, partly because of these pseudo-scientific <laughs> approaches whereby ideas are just taken and implemented without properly testing and understanding those, uh, those ideas first. And I always say to my students, going back to your point earlier, that um, you should spend as long as you can understanding the place. There's a tendency with architects in particular, I'm an architect myself, to jump to the solution actually testing and understanding, critiquing your ideas is incredibly valuable. And you spend as long as you can on that, and then the right solution will emerge for the place, um, rather than jumping too quickly to the final response or outcome. Is there any other question? Keep 
Do you mean in terms of an individual project or in terms of the way we shape the city as a whole? No, I mean about the law of urbanism. Yeah. Yes, I think I think that an urban designer needs to be open to all of these different influences and how they ultimately shape places. Because an urban designer is not is not all powerful. Actually, most urban designers their power within this wider set of power relationships is relatively limited. And what do they bring to it? Well, they bring that knowledge and that ability to shape places and to design creatively, but also to understand how all these other stakeholders are influencing the place. And the ability to bring all those aspirations together and to shape them in such a way that we get better quality places. And I think that's the unique role of the urban design, and a very powerful one done well. Very powerful one. city as a whole and there's design urban design processes involved across all of those scales yesterday I, th I think I was making an argument around a sort of missing layer within planning in particular and I think there is a missing layer which relates to the sort of scales that I was talking about yesterday but urban design itself operates both at larger scales and at smaller scales above and beyond that Um, yeah. but, uh, but, but we can uh, imagine that the, that the large scale has more longer design process.
closer than the little scale. So okay, absolutely. We are in the, in the workshop. We're doing that. It's, it's La Serena is being be seen and designed and taught in its whole scale. And the work is being taught in, in its scale. Then students will have to go to the micro spaces and have this understanding of the yeah.